Hello, Wayne County Community College District students. This is Dr. Morrison. We've returned today to complete uh, a lecture on our gram negatives and gram positives. We did gram positives last time. So let's take a look today at our gram negatives, okay? So when you stay in gram negatives, gram negatives will stay red. Let's remember that. Gram negatives stay red. These are a few gram negatives that I've gotten together to uh, talk about. We have gram stain. Of course, the gram stain is going to be gram negative. All of these will look red under the microscope. Today, let's look at cocci, coxoid, and rods. And then we're going to look at some that are oxidase positive, but they're a different shape. They're called comma shapes. They look like a little comma, like that. Okay? Let's start here with the cocci. Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria is a big uh, group of species that are uh, shaped in a diplococci shape, meaning they're kind of two cocci, kind of stuck together like that. That's diplococci. They might be more like that. <laughs> um, and many of them have capsules uh, and fimbrae, not all. Um, they have an outer membrane with a lipopolysaccharide. Remember the LPS go are associated with gram negatives and that can, uh, they have that of course in the cell wall and that helps make them virulent of the gram negatives that is. As a big category of uh, the genus of Neisseria, um, they're strict parasites. They really don't do too well um, outside of a host, uh, especially environmental, in environmental conditions that are dry or cold or acidic or have a lot of light. So these, the, 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 the genus of the Neisseria are pretty um, vulnerable, in other words, outside of the host, okay? They're aerobic, non-spore forming, so of course these don't uh, form spores, and they're non-motile, so they don't move. They produce catalase. We talked about catalase when we did gram positives with uh, differentiating um, between the uh, with Staphylococcus, remember? And that had to do with hydrogen peroxide uh, using enzyme catalase forming water and oxygen. So you take a little bit of this nice area, put some catalase on it. If it bubbles up, it shows that it uh, produces um, oxygen, so that means, okay, it is catalase positive. That's just a test to just uh, look at this uh, species, uh, this genus, this genus. So the enzymes ferment um, carbohydrates. Both of these, the meningitis and the gonorrhea, ferment glucose, but um, only the meningitis um, from its maltose. So maltose and glucose are fermented by Neisseria meningitis and just glucose for gonorrhea. So you can remember that G for glucose and the M and the G for maltose and glucose. Okay. So let's take a look and see what um, Neisseria meningitidis is about. Neisseria meningitidis, since it's the first one on the board. Um, Neisseria meningitidis has a polysaccharide capsule. Now, one time before, I mentioned to you about the importance of a bacteria having a capsule. When a bacteria has a capsule, it, that capsule is very protective of the bacteria. So it prevents it from what? Correct. It prevents that bacteria from being phagocytized or eaten, right? We talked about that a little bit when we did the gram positives. What's the second thing that 
is helpful to the host, us as humans, when a bacteria has a capsule. Correct, that capsule can be crunched up and then made into a vaccine. So that is a positive thing for a bacteria having a capsule. So it can be a negative thing in that it helps make the bacteria more virulent because it prevents um, uh, phagocytosis. But by the same token, it can be an advantage to the host because you can crunch it up and make it have a, uh, a vaccine. Fortunately, we, that's exactly what we did. So Neisseria meningitis, there's a vaccine for, uh, to prevent meningitis. And you can uh, get your meningococcal vaccine. And especially in times or areas where you're going off to college, um, uh, um, you're living in and you're living in these dorm situations or you're going off to the armed service and you're living in the barracks and you're close and or you're living in some close quarters where a lot of people are meningitis can easily spread that way so it's best to get a vaccine and especially too if you're going to travel to areas that are indigenous to um, having uh, meningitis some countries have a tendency to uh, be to have more um, susceptible to meningitis. All right, so let's see what else we got here. We said that it's a maltose fermenter as well as a glucose fermenter. Both ferment glucose. All right, you get a vaccine. That's true due to the capsule. Um, this, of course. Like most things that we're familiar with, especially even now, it's uh, transmitted via respiratory droplets. A lot, a lot of things, not just viruses, but a lot of bacteria are also transmitted via respiratory droplets. Maybe we'll just have a new fashion and just wear masks every day, all day, right? Um, and of course, respiratory droplets and oral secretions, probably don't want to eat after people you don't really no, probably don't want to eat after people anyway. Hey, here. Okay, here. Taste this. Nah, I'm good. Um, causes meningeal coccinia and meningitis. Um, and um, it could cause also, with this meningitis, it could cause a Waterhouse uh, Fredrickson uh, type of syndrome where you have an acute primary adrenal insufficiency and you get adrenal due to adrenal hemorrhages. So this is a really bad uh, thing to have and get. You have to be treated, this is just FYI, you have to be treated with a, uh, trying to fix my clothes here, you have to be treated, don't worry about it, you have to be treated with a third, at least a third generation uh, uh, antibiotic, usually a cephalosporin, that will go through the blood-brain barrier. Not all, back, not all antibiotics cross the blood-brain barrier. So you can be taking a lot of antibiotics, but they have to get through that blood-brain barrier in order to treat uh, meningitis, okay? So that's um, just look at that one. And I think that as far as my notes, um, I, th I think as far as my notes, that's uh, sufficient. So let's look at Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, this has no polysaccharide capsule, so no capsule for it. Um, it's, it's still pretty bad, but you know, it's no capsule as compared to the meningitis, which has a capsule, remember that. Um, no maltose fermentation, just glucose, and we remember that just for the G. And in this one, we know it's maltose and glucose because of the M and the G and meningitis. meningitis. No vaccine for Neisseria gonorrhea. Sorry, guys, no vaccine. Um, it's really due to um, antigenic variation of the pilus protein. So remember the pilus? or the pillus, um, a lot of things that 
allow attachment or adhesion. All right, so that's what this bacteria is really good at, sticking, all right, especially to mucosal surface, surfaces, which, as you can recognize this, is a sexually transmitted disease. They call it sexually trans STD or STI, meaning a sexually transmitted infection or sexually transmitted disease if you use a D part. Um, this causes the gonorrhea. It's sexually and perinatally transmitted. So if the mom has active or is, has gonorrhea and the baby, of course, comes through the vaginal canal, that baby is gonna also be coated with that uh, bacteria. And so usually, and not usually, always, we put drops in the eyes to prevent any type of uh, infection in the eyes from coming through the birth canal, right? So it could cause uh, gonorrhea, which is supposed to be um, reported to the CDC. Uh, septic arthritis, neonatal conjunctivitis, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease, call that a PID, um, and, and that's uh, about it. Condoms would be the, the, the mechanism du jour, the mechanism of the day to prevent this disease, birth control, you know, like oral or any other type besides the condoms don't really prevent gonorrhea or any sexually transmitted disease. But condoms will definitely decrease the sexual, sexual transmission. Um, we use, of course, erythromycin ointment to put in the neonate's eyes if we um, prevent neonatal transmission in the eyes. And another thing I wanted to mention about this, which is not my favorite, but I know, is that gonorrhea and chlamydia are best friends, actually. When they see each other, they just hug and they are so, they just love each other. So if you get treated for one thing, which would be the Neisseria gonorrhea, please also insist upon getting treated for the other, which would be uh, chlamydia. So you'll need two different types of antibiotics to kill two different types of uh, bacteria. So I just wanted to mention that those two things, chlamydia and Neisseria uh, gonorrhea, uh, are best friends and they do go hand in hand. Usually, if you're infected with one, you're infected with the other. So always keep that in mind. Don't let your doctor just give you one antibiotic and say, oh, this will kill them both. No, you need two different kinds of antibiotics to treat it. Um, is there anything else I could tell So the virulence, what makes this virulent? Well, um, it's the fembrae, okay? It's, um, it's virulent due to the fembrae and a protease that inactivates IgA, which is an anti antibody. A protease that act inactivates or stops the IgA from trying to do its job, which is to protect you and your immune system, right? So here, it would be the capsule is what makes that um, virulent. And then here for gonorrhea, it would be the fembrae that makes it virulent. Okay. I think in your text, there's a picture of what it looks like. So you could be my guest and look at that and you'll have a, a better um, understanding of the seriousness of that uh, disease. Let's take a look here then at now some oops, some bacteria that are kind of round but not quite. They're kind of round, they're kind of rods. So they're kind of like plump rods. They're kind of round and kind of like rods. So they call them kind of coxoid, as you can say that. Haemophilus influenza, Pasturella, Brucella, and Bordetella Pertussis. Now these are in this some kind of Ella, so you can remember those from the Ellas. Pasturella, Brucella, and Bordetella. And you can see that this is one that causes pertussis, which is a, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Let's go back up and look at Haemophilus influenza. Haemophilus influenza, despite, in spite of, despite the name, 
influenza. This is not, uh, this does not cause the flu. It does not. It's just called this. And usually you will see it like this when it's a vaccine. Oops. Haemophilus influenza type B. If you've ever seen that on your children's um, uh, immunization card or even your own, yeah, you could probably get it. Back when I was around, they didn't have this as a vaccine. So anyway, Haemophilus influenza type B causes uh, uh, this influenza, this Haemophilus influenza is not uh, related to the flu at all. It is a bacteria. It's not a virus. All right, so let's make that distinction. The flu is caused by viruses. So, um, in the big scheme of things, let's talk about the genus, the Haemophilus. Some Haemophilus species are normal colonists of the upper respiratory tract or the vagina, and other like Haemophilus parainfluenza and Haemophilus ducuri are virulent species responsible for childhood meningitis and chancroids, and that would be respectively. So let's look at Haemophilus influenza. Haemophilus means blood loving, blood loving. It causes meningitis. Otitis media, which means middle ear infection or ear infection, pneumonia, and a big one is epiglottitis. This was one reason that this vaccine was um, implemented because of epiglottitis. Epiglottitis, well, like meningitis and pneumonia, are also life threatening, but epiglottitis is where your epiglottis in children, the epiglottis will swell up so big that it will cut off the airway. So then you can't um, breathe. So anybody that comes into your clinic or into your, onto your floor in your ward and their head is outreach like this, let me make sure you can see, it's out, the neck is stretched out and they're drooling. Don't try to have a conversation with that person. Don't try to agitate them or ask them, what's wrong? What brought you to the hospital? Why are you here? No, that's not a person to have a conversation with. That's a person to sedate and try to intubate ASAP. Because if they're drooling and their neck is poked out like this, they're trying to keep that airway open and get any air in whatsoever. So that's, that's a person to sedate and intubate immediately. You can get your conversation on with someone that is comes that you could call from looking at his his wallet or looking through her purse and get a con emergency contact but that's not the person to talk to um i don't know if you knew um uh i think it was bill bixby his uh, his son uh he played uh um, who did he play um what's that big green mountain mount monster uh, the hulk so he played as the hulk and um and back in my day he played on the courtship of betty's father but we won't talk about that because that dates me but he played the hulk and anyway before that he had a child that was about six or seven his son had epiglottitis took him down to the hospital but the epiglottis got so big it did block off their way and his son um, ended up passing away. So it is a pretty big deal. And now, please, if I, I don't know if you believe in vaccines or not, I personally do. I vaccinated my children, but this is a good one to have to be vaccinated for sure. Aerosol transmission, once again, respiratory is in the air. Uh, usually seen in children though, usually adults don't. Get that you have to be in close contact with the nose and throat and some oral discharges right the most invasive disease caused by this capsular type b here again it has a capsule capsular type b so we're able to crunch it and get what a vaccine the hib vaccine thank goodness for the capsule produces another type of it produces a protease an iga protease um and so that can also be considered to be um, virulent. Um, 
It's interesting that you have to culture this on chocolate auger, which is means it's blood auger, and it requires uh, factors five, which is a NAD, and a factor 10, which is like a blood, a, a heme, for growth, right? Um, if anybody came in contact with a person with um, hemophilus influenza, you just give them a rifampin as a prophylaxis, right? Anybody, is, if any outbreaks tend to occur sporadically, usually in daycares and family settings, just give the whole families uh, to take a course of rifampin. That would be prophylaxis to prevent them from getting it. Now, I mentioned hemophilus influenza, that's the main one that we um, talked about. Um, we have homophilus uh, para-influenza um, and homophilus decuri. Now decuri, uh, it, it looks, it's spelled like this. Uh, I'm gonna put it here. No, I'm gonna put it here so you could just, just in case you run across or decry. Decry. Maybe you can pronounce it either way. But this produces a, a shanker, a shanker, uh, or a shankeroid. But it's a soft one and it hurts. It's an STD, right? Not so much seen in our region, but seen like in the tropics and the subtropics, so really warm regions. It becomes painful and it's a necrotic ulcer, so the, the skin uh, begins to uh, kind of uh, disintegrate or necrose away, and usually seen on the tips of penises of, of males, because males are the ones with penises. So it's usually on the, on the tips of uh, the male's penis. And usually, like I said, we don't see that that much in this country, but it is seen in tropics and subtropics, okay? So those two, it's, like I said, homophilus is a pretty big category. It's quite a few homophilus para-influenza, homophilus decryri or decryri, um, and homophilus influenza. Okay, so those are the ones. Pasturella. Pasturella is a, a zoonotic genus. It's normal in animals. It's responsible for opportunistic infections. Um, usually seen, pastorella is seen in wild, in, uh, in fowl, wild fowl. So those are birds. I don't know what I was thinking. And they're susceptible to cholera like outbreaks, right? Um, Cattle are especially prone to having uh, pasturella. So when you remember this, just think about something out in the pasture, like cows, for example. So that will help you um, to kind of remember that. They have epidemic um, outbreaks, hemorrhagic septicemia, and pneumonia. And this is known as shipping fever. It's found in the nasal pharynx of household cats and the tonsils of dogs. So a lot of this is very animal, zoonotic related, right? And now this is the thing. So you get this through animal bites and animal scratches, usually from cats or dogs, and they will cause a local abscess. So wherever the dog or cat scratched you or bit you, that's where you would get the abscess, right? And that could spread to the joints and the bones and to the lymph nodes if you don't take care of it right away. If you get any cut or abrasion, you wash it right away. This is even if you're outside, come in, get some soap and water and wash it out as quickly as possible. Uh, a dog bite, cat bite, scratch, things like that, you have to take care of those. Don't take them lightly. Wash them with soap and water as quickly as possible. Uh, immunocompromised people, um, are, of course, at greater risk for septicemia. Uh, complications involve the central nervous system and the heart. Uh, um, and those with lung problems are vulnerable to pulmonary failure. So pastorella 
usually seen from cats and dogs in our type of environment, but can be seen in cattle uh, when you're out at the farm. So you'll just remember pastorella with cattle, or just say domestic animals as well. Let's look at brucella. Brucella definitely with uh, uh, cattle. So brucella is, a, or brucellosis is another way of looking at this. It has an undulating fever. So undulating means that you have fever, then it goes away. And you have fever, then it goes away. And you have fever. So here you have fever, here it uh, went away. You have fever, then it went away. So it's undulating. It's, you know, it comes and it goes. It's like in a wave, so to speak. Oh, so to speak. Um, it's zoonosis as well. It's transmitted to humans from infected animals. It's caused by the ingestion of unpasteurized dairy products and uh, can contaminate uh, products contaminated with brucella abortus. This is coming from cattle. So don't drink unpasteurized milk. I know, I know that's a trend to drink that, but just don't do it. It's too great a risk to get some kind of bacteria that could cause you uh, a great deal of harm. That is the reason we pasteurize milk in the first place. Um, they have a, if this can, you could get from cattle or pigs, okay? Any infected animal with the brucellosis. Slaughterhouses, um, livestock handling, and veterinarians are at high, high risk of getting brucellosis, right? You have a fluctuating fever, chills, profuse sweating, headache, muscle pain, weakness, and weight loss. Fatalities, though, are uncommon. That's a good thing. You just get sick as a dog. Uh, uh, you get sick. Perhaps several weeks to a year, even, with treatment. So it takes a long time to recover from this. Um, virulence factors. Can hide. So the virulence factor, the main thing is brucella can hide in macrophages. So the very thing that's supposed to be coming to eat it, to get rid of it from your body, it can hide there. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. And it can survive and grow in macrophages. Insane. That can lead to a chronic infection. Um, the best thing we got, though, is a vaccine for the animals. But it's ineffective and unsafe for humans. So humans don't have a vaccine against it. But if the animals are vaccinated, then they won't get it. So that lessens and decreases, of course, the chance and opportunities for humans, like farmers and, like I said, veterinarians to get it. So that'll decrease it if the animal is vaccinated. Let's look at Bordadella pertussis. Um, Bordadella pertussis. This is a really quick or an acute communicable disease. Um, in childhood, it's a respiratory disease. You see the word pertussis on here? That is whooping cough. Like, you, it's, it's like this. <gasps> so I've taken care of babies that have that. They can not even uh, drink from a bottle. They're so, they're coughing so much. So this is another thing that is avoidable by vaccination. Right? So far we got these two, you get vaccinated babies and you won't have, they won't get those diseases. This, of course, is vaccine, so it's an encapsulated organism. Get the drip, encapsulate it, get the capsule, crunch it up, make the vaccine. Yay! But also the capsule makes the organism virulent because it prevents it from getting eaten, phagos attacks. So I think you got that point. The vaccine, of course, is uh, this DT, I think they put an AP there now, uh, for diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Acellular pertussis. Okay, that's this. Diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. Those three all go in one shot. So that's good, it's not three separate shots, okay? So pertussis is often severe 
Contrary to popular belief that it is mild and self-limiting, uh, it's often severe and life-threatening. All right? And I told you, I took care of the baby with that, and that was pretty severe. The child couldn't even eat coffee all night long. Direct contact with inhaled droplets or aerosols during the coughing stage of infection. That's how the child gets it. Usually, it's the children from birth to four years old. That's why this is one of the first vaccines we give within that 18-month uh, period where you're coming in, or 12-month to 18-month period where you're coming in quite a bit. Uh, the virulence is adhesion molecules that adhere to uh, the ciliated respiratory epithelial cells. Toxins destroy and dislodge the ciliated cells. And this loss of cilia leads to a buildup of mucus and a blockage of the airway. Okay? Cilia is the primary host defense. Cilia beat, you guys remember this, it beats up and out. Mucus is located there in association with the cilia and it helps trap anything so that you can cough it out, sneeze it out, whatever, get rid of it. But once the cilia is now paralyzed, the cilia will not be able to beat, and you, it, the cilia get destroyed, so now you got a big buildup of mucus, and it's going to be able to block the airway. Yes, two stages to this, two stages to uh, Bordadella pertussis. You have the, ca the capital, uh, stage that's the initial stage where you just kind of think you have a cold, nasal drainage, congestion, sneezing, and occasional coughing. Not a big deal, not the kind of cough that you get with the <gasps> like a staccato cough and then another whoop swoop. <gasps> that is the whooping cough. That's how you get that. And a paroxysmal stage. So the first one was capital stage. Well, you just think you have a mild cold, you got this nasal drip, got a little cough, you know, you just, you know, you got some congestion. But then the next stage, the paroxysmal stage, is recurrent persisting coughing, abrupt hacking coughing, with deep inhalation, trying to grasp air, okay? And the mucus and congestion produces a hoop. So remember, it's two stages to this. Mild at first, but then it gets much more serious afterwards. Complications of pertussis are due to a compromised respiration. Anytime your breathing is compromised, that's going to be a problem. All right? Those will be all of the coxoid, and we did the coccus, so we're going to move on to the rods. Okay, so let's look at these rods here under gram negative. These are gram negative rods. These are gonna be uh, with lactose and the auger will be McConkie's auger. Some are gonna be lactose fermenters like this group here. Others will not ferment lactose, so they're gonna be lactose non-fermenters and that will be this group here. Uh, the lactose fermenters on McConkie's auger will look pink. The lactose non-fermenters on McConkie's auger will be white. I'm not going to really worry about these oxidase, but let's go over here and look at the lactose fermenters. The big category with uh, really fast fermenters and slow fermenters, and we remember lactose is a uh, dairy sugar. So these in this group will ferment or ripen or are compatible with these, uh, this lactose, uh, this, this dairy sugar. Let's leave it at that. Fast fermenters here, Escherichia coli, also known as E. coli, Enterobacter and Klebsiella. Kind of slow fermenters here, Citrobacter, which I don't really talk about a lot, not really much to say about it. Serratia, we use that in lab, so you're familiar with it. First time, every time you see serratia, you will just remember that at room temperature, it is a red color. That gives it away. That's why I never choose that one as an unknown, because it just gives it away. So here, uh, let's look at Escherichia coli. It's kind of a big um, group, because Escherichia coli or E. coli 
is a cause of a lot of things. Um, most familiar, of course, would be urinary tract infections. That's actually it's the number one cause of urinary tract infections. So we call that a cystitis. The, the, uh, the bladder um, is a, a the urinary bladder gets inflamed, that's a cystitis, because the bacteria is able to climb upwards and up the uh, urethra and land in that bladder, the urinary bladder. Of course, if it keeps climbing, going up the uh, ureters, it can land in the kidney itself and cause havoc on the kidneys and that will be known as a pyelonephritis. That leaves the kidney scarred. You have to be in the hospital uh, for at least 10 days. IV antibiotics, uh, I, yeah, IV antibiotics, etc., with uh, like two or three different uh, types of antibiotics. Uh, e. coli can also cause a pneumonia, neonatal meningitis, and septic shock. So E. coli is nothing to um, play with. We always know too a lot of foods. Uh, uh, get contaminated with E. coli, we eat it because you know that comes out of the fecal matter, then we get sick, get a gastroenteritis, right? All right. So what makes this, uh, this category so profound is that there are four categories of it. So you have the intra-invasive E. coli, which is uh, the toxin is invasive, gives you a bloody diarrhea, um, and but it has oh, it gives a bloody diarrhea. Let me back that up. But it has no toxin. It is a uh, let me see if I can just write it out so you can get an idea of let me use a different color here. So for E. coli, Escherichia coli. We have the enteral invasive E. coli and that will be E. I. E. C. So that is enteral invasive E. coli. Get a bloody dysentery, uh, virulent need some hydration, but you don't use antibiotics. Don't use antibiotics for that, okay? This microbe invades and causes necrosis and inflammation. Just wait it out, get some IV hydration and just poop it on out. This one is enterohemorrhagic. E. coli, E. H. E. C. So this is E. I. E. C. And this is E. H. E. C. This one, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, this is the one that you hear about on the news all the time that's associated with. Uh, Never can remember if that's a O or or a zero five seven uh, H seven. Anyway, that's the one that you always hear about on the news that is causing a lot of problems. This gives a, a shigella or sugar like toxin. I will be asking that. So this one gives a sugar S H I G right here. S H I G, sugar or shigella like toxin, right? Uh, the damages uh, that the toxin causes damage. Not the bacteria itself, the toxin causes the damage. And that sugar toxin, so I'm going to write that in association with this shig toxin. So you remember, this is the one you hear about when you have the um, the, what is that? When you have ground beef, uh, does it get cooked thoroughly? Then you get this one. Um, you hear about that all the time. It, it gives the toxin alone, 
causes the uh, necrosis and inflammation. Really, it's undercooked hamburgers, undercooked beef. Here again, you don't really need to give antibiotics. You just need to let that person get hydrated and just poop it on out. It will poop out. Usually, you won't have a too much of a problem with that. This one, another type of E. coli, uh, entero toxigenic E. coli. So this is E. T. E. C. Entero toxigenic E. coli. E. coli. E. C. is always for E. coli, right? This is, causes an increase in chloride secretion. This is the one, you remember this T for travelers. This is the traveler's diarrhea. Anybody's ever traveled, like if I even step one foot inside of, well, I may not say that because if I say that, that'll come off a certain way. So I'll just say it's a certain country that if I even, if I ever go, I go there, I just step my foot across the border line, I end up with uh, traveler's diarrhea. So you'll remember that it's caused by enterotoxigenic E. coli. You'll remember that T for travelers, okay? It's uh, just a watery diarrhea. I, I will say it's kind of similar to cholera, but cholera has a rice watery stool. This one's not exactly like that, but I guess it's so watery until maybe that's why you can have that um, distinction. And then here is the last one. I guess I could just squeeze it in over here. This is an intero enteropathogenic E. coli and this is E. P. E. C. E. P. E. C. And you'll remember this P for pediatric. The pediatric group sees this kind of E. coli. Okay, Still, no toxin associated with this one. But it adheres to the apical surface, like the top surface in the uh, villi, and it flattens the villi out. So, uh, and, and so with that, you know, in the, mm, that's the small intestines, you need villi for absorption. Well, this uh, enteropathogenic E. coli will just go in and like these are the villi, it'll go and kind of shear them off so you don't get any uh, absorption. So no toxin, no. just have diarrhea and this is usually seen in children. So we'll remember this P for the pediatric group. Enteral invasive, no toxin, but uh, really bloody diarrhea. Uh, enteral hemorrhagic is going to cause some uh, you may have bloody diarrhea with this one too because it causes necrosis and inflammation. Usually seen in connection with undercooked beef. You hear about this one in the news all the time and it's associated with this. I can't remember if, for the life of me. I think that's a, a, a 0157H7 and associate that with Shig uh, toxin. And then enterotoxigenic E. coli, remember that's for traveler's diarrhea. And then this one, enteropathogenic E. coli, is seen in the pediatric um, population. Um, really, the only one that has a toxin would be um, the, uh, uh, this one with the Shig toxin. All right? So just um, keep that in mind. Let's look at this big group now. This whole thing is the Enterobacteriaceae group. Now, Enterobacteriaceae really is a family of, let's see, all of these, um, Seratia, E. coli, uh, Salmonella, um, let's see, Proteus, and Klebsiella. These are the ones that are in this big group called the Enterobacteriaceae group. And the reason I mention them is because they have something that you're going to have to know about, a K-O-H. You're going to have to know what those letters mean, K-O-H. Let me go back over here. Um, so the K is 
associated with the flagella, the flagella. And the flagella is, of course, uh, there for motility, right? So that the species can move, right? And, oh, let me go back. The K, the K is for, it's not for flagella. Let me make this, uh, straighten this out. The K is for virulence. Make sure that's right. The K is for virulence. <sighs> Sometimes, um, like a capsule, just remember K for capsule. So go back and make sure that you put K for virulence. The K is for virulence, okay? It's uh, the capsular K antigen um, is virulent. That's the virulent part of the bug. The O is a somatic um, antigen, and that really has to do with the uh, polysaccharides endotoxin, the O. Now the H is for uh, the flagellum, and this allows movement of the uh, species, okay? So in all of these ferment glucose, and all of these are oxidase uh, negative, right? So the K is for the... Um, Virulence, the O is the polysaccharide uh, endotoxin, and the H is for movement, the flagella. So make sure you know what KOH means in association with Enterobacteriaceae, okay? And then, I, of course, I got Enterobacter here. Um, that really is for most opportunistic cause of uh, infection. Uh, primarily when the uh, the host defenses fail. So when the host is kind of under the weather, something is bothering the host, is not feeling that great, then this is an opportunity for enterobacteria to just say, oh, I'm going to come over and make this person even sicker. So most opportunistic cause infection, primarily when the natural host defenses fail, often in conjunction with medical procedures. Enterobacter. Klebsiella is a large, has a very large capsule. Remember we did the capsular stain? That was with the bacteria uh, Klebsiella. Klebsiella is interesting in that um, when uh, usually seen in um, like an indigent population, mainly like uh, alcoholics as well. If they get a pneumonia, they will generally, I've seen them have a, like this current jelly, they, when they cough it up, it looks like a current jelly type of phlegm or mucus or, but you'll know that that is a uh, Klebsiella. Once you see it, you never forget it. It's got, like, just associate four A's with this, four A's aspiration pneumonia. So this person is, was eating something or drinking something and it went into the lung. Uh, abscesses in the lung, that's the other A. Um, alcoholics, that's the A. And then diabetes, the A in uh, diabetes, so diabetics. So you have um, aspiration pneumonia, abscesses. Uh, alcoholics and diabetes, so the uh, it just it makes it easier to remember with four A's. Of course, it is an intestinal flora, it's in the gut, so, but when you have aspiration pneumonia, you have thrown up, and then instead of uh, having complete emesis coming out of the body, it kind of goes into the lung, so it's, you aspirate the stuff that was in the gut into the uh, lung. Okay, so an intestinal flora that causes pneumonia in alcoholics and diabetics when aspirated. You do get this red current uh, sputum, and it also causes, uh, weirdly, nosocomial UTI, so hospital type of, of UTIs. That's Klebsiella, that, that, that one. So let's go over here to Citrobacter. Citrobacter, really, not a whole lot to say about it. It's a regular inhabitant of soil and water. It's in the human colon and occasional opportunistic uh, type of bacteria. 
Um, not um, a whole, whole lot to say about uh, Citrobacter. Serratia, on the other hand, is also seen in soil, water, and in the intestines. We use Serratia marcescens in the lab. You guys remember it because it was red at room temperature. This is so weird that once um, Serratia was considered to be so benign that it um, was used to trace the air current in the air current movements in hospitals and over cities. Like they really did put a bacteria in the air on purpose to trace the air current in hospitals and uh, in, in over cities. That, that's something to think about, although I'm not in part of a conspiracy theory type person. Um, Serratia induced uh, pneumonia uh, is seen in alcoholics and is transmitted by contaminated respiratory uh, care equipment and infusions. Um, it's, it is implicated in burn and wound infections and it can result, of course, in a fatal septicemia and uh, meningitis in the immunosuppressed patient. So somebody that is taken I don't know, steroids for whatever reason to maybe not reject an organ, these people would be uh, susceptible to a lot of, a host of things, but serratia is one of them. Let's look over at uh, the lactose non-fermenter um, that would be white uh, on McConkie's auger. I know I'm, I see that this oxidase, these are all, all the enterobacteria say are oxidase negative, so the only one I would remember if I were you would be Pseudomonas. Um, I always associate that immediately with oxidase positive. Uh, that is the only thing I remember um, when I see oxidase. That's the, thing, that's the way I remember it. So let's look at uh, Shigella. Shigella uh, versus Salmonella. So Shigella and Salmonella are interesting in that Shigella is seen in uh, so Shigella and Salmonella. Shigella is seen in humans only. Um, it goes um, like cell to cell, no real septicemia, no hematogenous spread, meaning it's not gonna just go and um, just make you um, bleed out. It does not produce um, hydrogen sulfide. Um, that's in comparison to salmonella, which um, is seen in humans and animals. It can be uh, disseminate hematogenously. In other words, it can cause a septicemia. In, in other words, it can poison your blood. Salmonella can, but Shigella does not. Uh, salmonella does produce uh, hydrogen sulfide. So Shigella and humans only, and salmonella, humans and animals. Shigella goes cell to cell, no hematogenous spread, no septicemia. Salmonella, on the other hand, can disseminate hematogenously and will produce septicemia. Shigella does not produce uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Salmonella does produce hydrogen sulfide. Shigella has no motility. Salmonella does have motility because it has flagella. So when you see salmonella, just think of a fish like a salmon and know that it will move. It has flagella. Shigella does not. Um, the interesting thing about the endotoxin, the endotoxin is what's virulent with uh, salmonella. But the interesting thing about salmonella is, and remember this, you need a high, high dose to be infected with salmonella. So, for example, salmonella, you need like 10 to the fifth, 10 to the exponent, exponential, exponent five in order to get um, any type of signs of infection. That's a lot of uh, inoculum. But with Shigella, you just need a tiny bit. You don't need much, like 10 to the one. A low dose of Shigella it's that virulent that it will infect you. A lot, you need to have a lot of salmonella to get infected, but very little of shigella.
low dose, 10 to the 1, for example. This is 10 to the 5, so you need a lot more for salmonella. So with this one, Shigella, you need a very small inoculum in order to be, um, uh, to get sick. And another important thing about Shigella is it's quite resistant to intestinal acid. So a lot of people think that, oh, well, I got hydrochloric acid in my stomach. That'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Just eat it. No, Shigella is resistant to that. So it, it's really something. When I treated someone with uh, salmonella, little boy, his grandmother, I believe it was, hadn't cooked the chicken thoroughly, so he ended up getting salmonella poisoning. Um, he was quite active on the floor, doing quite well. Um, we decided not to put him on antibiotics, just let the salmonella run its course. So we just put him in a diaper, he ran around the floor, we kept him hydrated, popsicles, uh, drinking water, drinking juice, and eventually it passed. He pooped it all out. Never give him antibiotics because antibiotics can make can make things worse. Remember, we learned about C. diff in the gram positives, right? Antibiotic treated. Now you get rid of all the good bacteria. Now you're left with C. diff, and it's coming out and it's smelling, and it's really difficult to treat. I think we had to treat that uh, C. diff with, uh, if you recall from. The gram positives, metronidazole, right? Not any more antibiotics, right? So it, don't try not to treat pooping with antibiotics. That's the one thing. And another thing about pooping is sometimes people will prescribe low moto or something to slow down the pooping. No. If you're pooping, that is your body trying to get rid of the toxin, the thing that is making you sick. So poop it on out and just stay hydrated, all right? So that's just FYI. Um, other things to compare with this, and I'll be quick about it, is that uh, both could cause a bloody diarrhea, Shigella and Salmonella, right? Oh, and you can use antibiotics for Shigella. That may shorten the duration, but please do not use antibiotics for um, um, Salmonella. You know, you may, they both cause bloody diarrhea, um, you may want to give antibiotics for Shigella for some reason that shortens the duration. Antibiotics for Salmonella, that prolongs the duration of having that disease. No vaccine for either one, for either one of these, Shigella or Salmonella. Shigella, it, it, we get it from the four F's. Your fingers, flies, food, and feces. Blech. Fingers, flies, food, and feces is how we get inoculated with Shigella. On the other hand, like I mentioned about salmonella, it comes from poultry, um, eggs, um, pets like turtles are common sources. So, oh, and with your eggs, um, it's not the actual stuff that's in the egg, like the egg white and the yolk, it's the shell. Because you gotta remember that shell is getting, uh, coming out of the same orifice that the chicken poops out of. So if you don't want to get it, you either cook your eggs really well, or if you like them kind of sunny side up and you don't want to cook it, you have to rinse and clean off the shell of the egg because that's how you get the salmonella, not in the egg itself. Playing with turtles can also put you at risk for salmonella. And of course, any undercooked poultry, that includes turkey, um, any bird, a chicken especially. Um, we know that Shigella gives Shigella dysentery um, and like three other Shigella um, with other species. And let's see, invasion skin. So that's really about it. Shigella is very invasive and it's the key to pathogenicity. Invasion is the key for Shigella and pathogenicity. Uh, Organisms that produce little toxin can cause disease due to invasion. I mean, not a whole lot of toxin, but they can invade and really get into the system and cause a problem. Uh, salmonella is usually gastroenteritis and is caused by the non-typhoidal type of salmonella. Of course, that, that would um, be it. So those two, I just wanted to give a decent comparison of those two and hope that you go through your um, readings and get more information about those. You could write them side by side and put them in a category so you can see which one does and the other one does not do. 
Let's look at Proteus. I think we used Proteus in lab, Proteus vulgaris, if I recall. Um, you remember that it is uh, motile? Do you remember that? And that it is a sulfur producing bacteria. Let me see if I have it in my notes somewhere. Probably uh, causes swarm, swarming in auger, right? Produces urease and is associated, believe it or not, with kidney stones with URI, okay? Uh, UTI. So it is, uh, it is, gives a urinary tract infection uh, with uh, struvite and urease, urease. Associated with struvite kidney stones, UTI. That's what I meant to say, but I got distracted. Okay, so it is uh, associated with uh, kidney stones and uh, urinary tract infection. Let's look at this one. Where are we now? Here we are with Pseudomonas. Yeah, hey, Pseudomonas. I do remember Pseudomonas quite well because it is oxidase positive. I like the color of Pseudomonas because it gives off a bluish green hue, right? And but it has this grape-like odor, and it's found in the water source, right? Proteus, uh, Pseudomonas is really step over here. Pseudomonas is related to uh, wound and burn infections, right? And another thing is if a person has a pneumonia and they have cystic fibrosis, uh, nine times out of 10, it's gonna be a pseudomonas type of pneumonia. They're gonna be infected with pseudomonas. That's seen as cystic fibrosis pneumonia. Wound infections, um, burns infections, things like that will show this kind of bluish green hue over the infection. Um, it could cause a uh, swimmer's ear, if you ever heard that. That's uh, otitis externa, where you even just touch the pin of the ear, it would just hurt like heck where there's water and where the pseudomonas has um, gotten into uh, the ear. Um, it could cause a UTI, also a urinary tract infection, usually catheter related. Somebody put the catheter in and pseudomonas was on the catheter, probably because of a biofilm. Remember how sticky that is, right? Um, it could cause osteomyelitis, you get uh, infection with pseudomonas from hot tub folliculitis. So pseudomonas is all over the place, okay? So let's just remember it's a bluish green uh, pigment and it's really pretty and you will never forget it once you see it. Let's go up here and look at these other oxidase positive um, bacteria. But these are comma shaped, they're not rod shaped. These are comma shaped. So they kind of like Vibrio cholera, looks kind of like that, like a comma, right? So let's look at this one first, Campylobacter jejune. Uh, jejune, what, what part of the body would that be in? The, the small intestines, the jejunum, right? So this is where the name comes from. Let's see, it grows in 42 degrees centigrade. That is very hot. So when I see Campylobacter, I often think about, think about um, going to camp. You're sitting around the camp fire, so you know it's gonna grow on something hot, like 42 degrees centigrade, and it's Campylobacter um, jejune. Um, it's a fecal oral root, so somebody didn't wash their hands after they pooped, and they could give that to you. Uh, quite easily. Let's see, so you get a, a bloody diarrhea, can be transmitted from domestic animals to humans, and contaminated water and, uh, and food, undercooked poultry, and unpasteurized milk. Also, this is associated with uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a syndrome where you have paralysis in the lower part of the body. It usually subsides that's also associated a lot with um, viruses, too, and usually in children, but I have known some young adults that have gotten Guillain-Barre. But um, Campylobacter jejune is one that is a fecal oral root. Let's look at Vibrio cholera. Kind of the same thing with some really, uh, you know, dirty water or something. You see this a lot in countries, like when they have devastation. I remember, um, which one? I think it was Haiti. 
had a earthquake, I think, and all the water was filthy and, um, you know, because it's an earthquake. And, you know, people are thirsty, they're looking for resources. So when you're thirsty, uh, your thirst center is very strong. You will drink anything. So you drink that and then you end up just having a lot, a lot of rice water stools. I mean, this, this, this stool is like something you've never seen before. As soon as you're putting it in, it's coming out and it's just like water. And you can get dehydrated very easily with that. And in countries that don't have supportive um, medicine and able to just hook you up to an IV and as much fluid as you lose, you could get um, the IV, get fluids put back in. It's very easy to die from that. Um, we've seen that even here in our country with Katrina, people had cholera. It's very easily spread and is very easy to get because the thirst center from the hypothalamus is very strong and you will get thirsty and you will drink anything. So I think that that about sums it up with these gram negative bacteria for now. Um, I do want to, oh, I do see Legionella, Legionella and Legionosis on here and Helicobacter pylori. Um, if I have something right here, we'll um, go over it, but if I don't, what I'll do is pick that up at a later time. Um, uh, I do know the Helicobacter pylori. Well, I don't. I know a little something about these. So let's just look at Legionella. Um, I wanted to put these in a, another category of other bacteria because. I know that I broke this up into gram positive and gram negatives, but there are some other bacteria that I want you to be familiar with that it just didn't fall into uh, a certain category like that. Like I want you to look, I want you to look at Yersinia pestis. I want to look at these. That was just a note, so I remember to mention that there are other bacteria that I want to talk about, and I think we will talk about those on the next uh, time. So instead of me introducing these, I mean, I'll introduce these now, but we'll pick up with Legionella and Helicobacter pylori on the next video with other bacteria. So until then, I'll talk to you later.